I'm no stranger to Iowa. In fact, this is probably my, well, fourth, fifth, sixth trip to this state. So when Chad Shear, my good buddy from CDA Muzzleloader, suggested, well, maybe I join him in Iowa this coming fall for a late season muzzleloader hunt, I cleared my schedule and I set up a hunt. What just happened in November? Why is it transitioning to a new phase in December? And how can we take what we've learned over these past couple months and use it to our advantage when hunting here? I'm going to give you three ingredients that will help you understand the what, the why, and the how. Iowa is big buck country, and you're watching Deer and Deer Hunting TV. So what just happened in November and how does that relate or how does that transition to December, which most of the country calls late season? Now, if you're in the South, that's going to be pushed back a month and we're going to be talking about January and even into February is late season, but we're talking middle of the country, North, Midwest, Northeast. What is that late season transition? Well, first of all, let's look at November. November was primarily the rut month, breeding month. Everything is off. You know, the entire Whitetails calendar, 11 months out of the year, is built around food. And as Charlie Alshammer always taught us, he who has the food has the deer. Not the case in November. November, those deer are fighting, they're chasing, the bucks are feeling their oats, they're really wearing themselves out. They're prize fighters going across the landscape. You get to December, which is a good example. You get to December, now the fight's over, so to speak, the struggle's over, and it's time to replenish, to regroup, to regenerate themselves so they can make it through winter. So that's the way we have to look at it, is it is definitely a transition from one behavior to recouping and facing something that could be critical, which is winter. When we're talking about late season hunting, we're talking about three things primarily, food, cover, and pressure. Let me go through all three of them for you. If you do not have food on the property that you're hunting and you're trying to hunt late season in December, especially in snow country, it's gonna be a tough road for you. If you don't have the food, you better have the bedding cover. If you don't have the bedding cover, you better have the transition area from A to B. If you don't, if you've done it, you're gonna know it's a very, very tough road, especially public land guys. I've done it myself. Extremely difficult hunting in December if you don't have any of those parts of the recipe. That's the food aspect. We're gonna get more into that in a little bit. The second part is cover. Cover could be transition cover. It could be bedding cover. You have to have some type of cover. If you're just hunting open crop fields, really difficult, even if the food is there. No cover really makes it difficult because you get to number three, which is pressure. which is the misunderstood or maybe neglected item of the three. Because we get to December, man, we've got food, we've got standing corn, we've got soybeans, we've got brassicas, we've got some kind of food source that those deer are hammering in December. If you haven't paid attention to how those deer have been pressured up into this point, you're gonna be in for probably a world of disappointment because the second those deer pick up on you, and they will, it's gonna be basically a nocturnal game and it's gonna be really tough to hunt them. So cover is important for not only holding the deer, but how you approach that hunting and how you position your tree stands and your ground blinds. Deer and Deer Hunting is brought to you by Hunting in the late season can be difficult without proper scouting and winter food sources. But if you can provide the food, identify the cover, and maintain a low pressure environment, you're well on your way to some easy blood trailing. And there's no better place for late season whitetail hunting than the December muzzleloader hunt in Iowa, of which Mark Kaiser is more than familiar with. I'm no stranger to Iowa. In fact, this is probably my, well, fourth, fifth, sixth trip to this state. 
I would have came more often, but the very fact that you've got to have preference points, build them up so you can bow hunt, which has been my main focus over the years, well, it makes it a little tougher to hunt Iowa every year. But muzzleloader hunting, well, that's a little bit different story. A lot of the zones, you can almost do it every year if you're lucky enough. Build a preference point or two up and you're golden. So when my good friend Chad Shear from CVA Muzzleloader suggested maybe I join him in Iowa for the first season gun hunt, which is post rut hunting when those bucks are really hungry, I kind of cleared my schedule and was gonna meet him in Iowa in early December. We were gonna test out the new Paramount Pro on a big cornfield buck. One thing that was immediately evident about Iowa Whitetail Outfitters is the fact that, well, they deal in comfort. Our first day out, I couldn't believe the comfort of the blind. In fact, it was brand new. Mom, I'm home carpet on the floor. I sat in there with my boots off. It was so comfortable. I might have to blur that out for the younger viewers. But you never know what you're going to find. Day three, we switched it up. Hunting a new location today. We're real close to the hunting lodge. Same type of setup. Soybeans, standing soybeans. Pick soybeans behind us. A little bit windy, but wind is good because it covers any noise. Carries your scent further away when you're higher up like that. And hoping for a good set. The minute, I mean the minute, we had gotten into the blind, we were seeing deer coming out into the soybeans again. Some of these bucks that were starting to come out, hey, they were getting me cranked. One nice buck in particular stepped out, nice big four point, and then a, a four by five, and then another smaller five by five. Then this buck was split G2s. By the end of the afternoon, we had seen at least 35 deer, a dozen bucks, that's one to three buck to doe ratio. That's pretty good. And these bucks, they were doing a little chasing, but for the most part, they just posture between the bucks, showing the pecking order and letting everyone else feed. But the best thing we learned about the whole afternoon is this was a hot spot. If a big buck was gonna show up, this was one of the key spots where it would. And as shooting light disappeared, we didn't get our opportunity that day. But we put a big check on this place. This was a place we'd want to return. The last stand. We were at the Alamo and we needed to make a plan to win this last battle in Iowa. It's only a five day window to get the job done. And I needed to, I need to get the job done. It's been a relatively warm few days for Mark in Iowa so far. A lot of bucks have stuck to being nocturnal in most of the hunting areas, and he's down to his final day of hunting. His best bet is to head back to the soybean field, where, let's face it, he could have had his pick if given the opportunity. So that's exactly what he does the last stand. We were at the Alamo and we needed to make a plan to win this last battle in Iowa. It's only a five day window to get the job done. And I needed to, I need to get the job done. The first buck to show up was a beautiful five by five buck, but not in the traditional five by five makeup. He was a beautiful five on one side, good looking G2, G3, nice brows. But on his right side, he actually had a nice forked G2, like a mule deer. And that was the makeup of his four or his five by five rack. And I kept thinking, should I just shoot this deer and get it over with? No, that's not Mark's style. Mark pushes everything to the last minute.
10 minutes left and I look down the edge of the field and who steps out? The big four by four we'd seen the other night that was way off in the corner edge of the field. He was joined by another younger, taller four by four. The buck's moving closer. He was already close enough. I gotta admit that Paramount Pro, I have that dialed in dead on to 200 yards. I feel real confident to 400 yards with that muzzle loader. But this deer was facing straight at me. That buck was hungry. He was on a hunger tour. Just going straight at me, munching, munching, munching. Now he wasn't gaining many yards closer, just a yard or two at a time. But what he was doing was making me crazy because it was straight on. And that's a risky shot. I know you can take that shot, shoot right between his antlers, hit him in the back. When he lifts his head, take that quick shot right into the chest area. But as much as he was eating, there's a lot of movement there. Last thing you want to do is wound a deer, blow an antler off. So I'm like, just calm down, just let the deer feed. He's gonna make a mistake sooner or later. And I just kept adjusting my rest. I actually put a coat up under my elbow and I was just as rock solid as you could be when that buck made a uh, fatal turn. That deer reared up and flipped over like I've never seen a deer do before. That hornady bullet drove deep inside him, 290 grains. The bullet was traveling at the velocity still probably over 2,000 feet a second at that point with that 209 blackhorn powder. And uh, well, let's just say we didn't have to track very far. <laughs> he was laying right there. The recovery, going up to that buck, seeing him in the soybeans. Yeah, I wanted to shoot a cornfield buck, but I'll take an Iowa soybean buck any day of the year. That was a gorgeous sight. The sun had set, we were out of shooting light, and I got to admire a buck that I had been hunting pretty hard for, at least any buck, good buck, and there he was, laying in the soybeans of Iowa. Okay, so how can you get in position to shoot a buck like that? Well, there's many different ways, and again, every area is different, but number one, hunt bedding areas. Don't go blundering right into those bedding areas. Number one, you have to know where they are. If you don't know where they are, you gotta get out there and scout. If you don't know it yourself, get some help, and find out, get a ballpark. You don't have to know exactly where these deer are bedding, but you can get a pretty good idea. Find out where that core bedding area is, or a general idea, and hunt within, I'd say, 100 yards of it. You want to catch those deer coming out of the bedding area, going to that food source, which is my second tip, hunt afternoons. Late season hunting, especially bow hunting, extraordinarily difficult in the mornings when it's cold out, when you have limited food sources, when you have limited cover, it just doesn't happen. What happens is I wind up busting and educating way more deer than I get in front of me that are within shooting range. Hunt afternoons. Find out when those deer are coming through that area that you're hunting, whether it's a feeding area, whether it's a transition area, or whether it's coming right out of that bedding area. Find those areas and have good entry and exit routes, which are critical, and hunt those afternoons. The third tip I'm gonna give you is whenever possible, hunt from an enclosed blind. Those enclosed blinds are awfully convenient in late season because you can bring more clothes, you can be warmer, but it also helps contain your scent. I know blinds are really constricting, that you're not gonna see everything around you. A deer might slip past you. If you have that blind in there in plenty of time in advance, it's gonna be a critical key to your success in the late season. Deer and Deer Hunting is brought to you by You can see on hunt stand here there's lots of different ways to use the app we're looking at a map here right now of where we are you can see where the deer are coming from off the winter wheat and how they're going to circle around downwind you can see the wind of course one of the features i like most 
is the moon phase information. Waxing gibbous moon today, 39%. You look at the active time periods. The AM major is like 7 AM till almost 10. That really was important this morning, and we saw that with the deer. You know, the sun came up, they were still coming off the wheat fields, then they eventually worked through down this creek here, heading to the bedding areas. So the ma minor and major time movements of game on the app here are really important if you have limited time to hunt. You can see the AM minor last night was just after midnight till almost three in the morning. Major, six o'clock till almost nine o'clock. The app is really bang on in terms of when these animals are moving, especially on those major time periods. You know, I've used this with predators and moose hunting and elk hunting and deer hunting, and it really does make a difference. If you have limited time to get in the field or you're wondering what your best time is to go sit, look at the app, check the moon phase, and even if it tells you the major's at one o'clock in the afternoon, don't doubt it. Get out there and sit in your stand, in your blind, get in the field, and you'll see that it does make a difference. And if you start to make notes on what happens during uh, the different moon phases and how much moon is illuminated, you'll soon see patterns to know when to book your holidays for prime time and how to avoid areas or times when the deer are moving more at night than during the day. Make sure you pick the majors that are in the daytime hours and you'll see your hunting success rate go up and your encounters with wildlife go up. There are many reasons that you want to maybe pick up a muzzleloader in your hunting career. First of all, you get to hunt some great seasons like early season in Kansas, late season in Iowa and South Dakota, and if you're an elk nut like me, Colorado elk rut hunting. Well, that's more than enough reason to pick up a muzzleloader, but you also get that chance at maybe an extra animal, an extra trophy, maybe a trophy bull or buck or a trophy freezer full of meat. Now Hornady, they see these opportunities, so they already offer a great lineup of muzzleloader products. New to their lineup though, in the last year, the Bore Driver FTX Bullet, it's ideal because it sits atop a polymer base, not a sabot, and that 290 gram projectile, well, it's a lethal dose of energy that will help you be successful in any muzzleloader season. So atop of that base, that polymer base, is the FTX Bullet. It's a gilded copper alloy jacket. Now, that makes it super tough, but it also has an interlock ring inside. So when this bullet hits home and that FTX begins allowing the expansion of that bullet, that interlock ring makes sure that the bullet doesn't expand too much, that it expands properly, and that creates a lethal wound channel. Now, what's so great about that? Well, you do not want that bullet to expand too much and too little. And so the technology developed into this bullet is that it will expand at low velocities. That means at long range or high velocities. And that means at close range, say 25, 30, 40, 50 yards, it's going to expand the same as it does at 150, 200, 300, or even beyond that. It's really an ideal bullet for any muzzleloader situation.